Rick walks outside to the scene of a sunny, calm day. He splashes water on his face, and the shot pans out to a vegetable garden towards which he is headed. Lining the gates of the garden lie a dozen walkers that have accumulated overnight, among which include a bloody-eyed walker. While listening to music and digging in the garden, Rick finds an M1911 handgun, fully loaded, which he examines for a moment and then tosses into his wheelbarrow. Carl walks towards Rick, complaining that his father had not awakened him. Rick says he had not done so due to the knowledge that Carl was up late reading comic books, and the two share a chuckle. Carl speaks of a pig that he calls Violet, laying in the corner of a pen, mentioning it looks ill. Rick tells Carl he should not name the pigs as they are food, yet answers that he does not know the reason of the pig's illness. In the outdoor confines of the prison, Carol cooks breakfast for the residents. Daryl joins her, while numerous survivors thank him for his hunting including a young man named Patrick. Carol makes a point that she liked him first and asks for a word with Daryl, transferring her cooking duties to Patrick. Patrick asks for a handshake from Daryl before he leaves to thank him for the venison he had hunted the day before. As they reach a secluded spot, Carol mentions the need for people at the gates. She says that others are speaking of a supply run, and notes that the walkers aren't spreading out across the fence like before. Glenn wakes up and talks with Maggie, telling her she should not accompany him on his supply run later in the day. There is no need. Maggie protests, saying everything will go smoothly and Glenn agrees, yet persists that she should remain at the prison. Ultimately, Maggie agrees to this and Glenn takes her place. A group of survivors, including Karen, are clearing walkers that have built up along the gate perimeter. Tyrese approaches Karen, whom he calls beautiful, telling her of his discomfort with killing walkers along the gate due to the face-to-face -face contact. Karen questions why he volunteers to help at the gates, to which he responds that he wanted to get to know her better. Tyrese tells her he's going on the supply run. Karen gives him a good luck kiss, and tells him to be careful. Carl and Patrick come upon Lizzie and the other children, naming walkers as they stand at the prison fence. Carl angrily tells them that they shouldn't name walkers, and asks Lizzie if she had even seen someone become one. Lizzie angrily responds that she has, and walks off with the other children. Meanwhile, Herschel is telling Rick about planting more crops when Michonne arrives on horseback from a scouting run. Dismounting Flame. She hands Carl comics she found and talks briefly with Rick about her unsuccessful run. She volunteers to check the traps for any animals before the walkers get them, but Rick decides to go himself. As he leaves, Herschel tells Rick that their counsel, himself, Glenn, Carol, Daryl and Sasha, prefer that Rick take his gun along when he goes outside the gates for protection. Carl expresses interest in going on the supply run, but Rick tells him to stay and do his chores. He also suggests that Carl stay with Patrick, and attend story time with the other children. As the supply group gets ready to leave, Zack meets up with Beth, and the pair kiss each other goodbye. Bob volunteers to go along to earn his keep. After some hesitation and convincing from the others, Sasha allows him to come. Rick goes outside the perimeter to check the traps, when he encounters Clara. Initially mistaking her for a walker, he is startled when she calls out to him, pleading for help. She asks if he is with a group, and begs him to take her and her husband Eddie with him. Rick tells her that if they answer three questions to his satisfaction, he will. Clara leads Rick in the direction their camp, so he can meet Eddie and ask his questions. Daryl, Zach, Sasha, Bob, and Tyrese reach an abandoned army encampment around a shopping mall. Daryl asks them to listen to the music booming in the distance, and notes that he had been part of a group that hooked it up to car batteries to draw the walkers away. The group approaches the front of the store, and Zack starts a conversation with Daryl. He tries to guess what Daryl's pre-apocalypse employment was. It is mentioned that this had been going on daily, for the past six weeks. Zack guesses a homicide cop and Daryl affirms the guess. An incredulous Zack apparently doesn't believe it, and states he will keep on trying to guess. The group enters the mall, and Bob, the last to enter, notices a pair of legs on the ground. As he follows the others in, the rest of the walker's body is revealed to be on the roof, along with a crashed helicopter and several dozen walkers. As Rick and Clara walk through the forest, Clara tells him that she and her husband Eddie were about to go on their honeymoon when the apocalypse began. They were at the airport, 
preparing for a flight to Puerto Vallarta when the walkers attacked. She claims that the two of them were the only survivors, and credits her husband with saving her life on many occasions. She also mentions having to do certain things to stay alive, and seems hesitant to elaborate. Rick presses her, and she says they had to eat animal carcasses and rotten fruit. Additionally, they had to leave people behind. In the store, Bob approaches a wine, beer aisle and tries to resist taking a bottle. He eventually gives in, but after thinking about it, decides to put it back. This causes the entire shelf to tip over, falling on top of him and pinning his legs. The walkers on the roof hear the noise, and begin walking toward it. The decaying roof sheathing can't support their weight, and several fall through. Meanwhile, Rick and Clara continue walking and make small talk. Clara interrupts to ask Rick if he and his group had to do the things Eddie and I had to do. When Rick doesn't answer, she follows up with another question. Do you think you get to come back from them? Rick says he hopes so. Clara then says that she hopes she and Eddie answer the three questions satisfactorily. Back at the mall, walkers continue to fall through the ceiling. With Bob still trapped beneath the shelf, the others are able to fight them off. Daryl and Zack succeed in freeing Bob, but Zack is bitten soon after. As everyone else escapes, the wrecked helicopter falls through the roof, killing Zack and the remaining walkers in the process. As Rick and Clara finally approach the campsite, she says, it is just ahead. She crouches over a small, suspicious-looking bundle, then suddenly attacks Rick with her knife. He manages to sidestep her, and Clara frantically explains that she intended to feed him to Eddie, who has turned. She then stabs herself in the abdomen, and collapses. As she lay dying, Clara tells Rick that she could not stand living without Eddie, so she took her own life to be with him. In a state of delirium, she pleads with Rick not to kill her after she turns. Her plan is to reanimate, and be with her husband in a zombified state. As Clara nears death, she asks Rick what the three questions were. He tells her, how many walkers have you killed? How many people have you killed? Why? She says that Eddie killed all the walkers for her until he died, and lists only herself as a human she has killed. To the last question, she responds, you don't get to come back. Eddie's body is not shown, nor are the contents of the bundle. But as Rick walks away, the bundle is shown to be grunting and moving about. It is about the size of a human head. Carol is reading a story to the kids in the prison library. Carl is seen sneaking in, and appears to be eavesdropping. He notices one of the adults leaving, after which Carol stops reading and begins teaching the children how to use knives. She asks him not to tell his father, and Carl leaves in disgust. After returning to the prison yard, Rick looks over at the fences and focuses on a bloody-eyed walker. He then goes to the pig pen, and realizes that Violet has died. The supply group returns, and Glenn tells Maggie that Daryl intends to deliver the bad news to Beth. Maggie gets up to console her, but stops to tell Glenn that she is not pregnant. Glenn is relieved, but Maggie says they shouldn't be afraid of having a child, even in the world as it is. Glenn suggests that being afraid is what has kept them alive. Maggie disagrees, saying, no, it's how we kept breathing. Daryl tells Beth what happened to Zack. She is surprisingly nonchalant, and resets the tally she was keeping of days without an accident. She tells Daryl that she doesn't cry anymore, and is glad she got to know Zack. She asks Daryl if he's okay, and he says he is tired of losing people. Beth walks up and hugs him. Michonne looks at a map, apparently making plans to search for the governor. Herschel tries to comfort Rick regarding what happened to Clara. Rick says that he could easily have become to what she was. Herschel disagrees, and says that people get to come back from what they do. However, Rick isn't convinced. Later that night, Bob lies in his bunk, reflecting on the day's events as Patrick stumbles toward the bathroom. He is obviously sick, and coughing violently. Without undressing, he walk into the showers and turns the water on. A few seconds later, he collapses on the floor with blood running from his mouth. He reanimates shortly after, with blood flowing from his eyes like the walkers Rick had seen previously. Late at night, an unknown person is shown feeding a rat to some of the fence walkers. The scene then swaps to Tyrese and Karen in the library, overlooking their lives and then Tyrese begins playfully singing to her. They both then head back to their respective cells. 
Karen takes a detour to the showers to fill up a pitcher of water, where she hears movement, but finds nothing. After she exits, a zombified Patrick rises out of the shower, undetected. He exits the showers and follows her back to the cell block. He stops at her room, but is distracted by the coughing of another person and wanders into his cell and proceeds to bite out the man's throat, preventing him from calling for help. At dawn, Patrick has finished devouring the man, and the latter soon awakens as a walker. Glenn and Maggie are sleeping in the guard tower. After waking, and Glenn manages to take a photo of Maggie with the instant camera that he retrieved from the department store. Rick and Carl head out to tend to the pigs and Carl asks if he can help with the fence cleaners, but Rick shuts the idea down. Carl apologizes and reassures his father that he is trying to live normally and asks if he can have his gun back. Before Rick can answer, they hear gunshots. Mika and Lizzie run out of cell block D, calling for help. A horde of walkers has attacked from within and killed several people. Michonne, who is just heading out on a supply run, is alerted to the chaos, but gets trapped by the prison gates with two fierce walkers. Just as the walkers manage to overpower her, Carl kills one of them, the other is kicked off by Michonne and then shot by Maggie. Michonne accidentally injures her leg on one of the snares, but is helped up by Maggie and Carl. In the cell block, the group clears out the walkers. Carol assists Ryan Samuels into a cell after he is bitten on the arm and prepares to amputate it, but finds that he has been bitten on the back of the neck as well. After the threat temporarily clears out, Daryl and Rick comb the area, searching for anyone bitten to ensure that they won't reanimate, when Glenn gets attacked by a walker. Daryl is able to shoot it in the head, and realizes that it was Patrick. Rick is initially hesitant about putting the people down, coming out of the first cell shaken and in a daze. Another bloody-eyed walker, Charlie, emerges from a cell and is put down by Rick. They realize that since Charlie locked himself in his cell due to his sleepwalking, that there was no way that he could have been bitten. Rick, Herschel, Drive, Subramanian, Daryl, and Bob gather around Charlie's body, noting that he has no bites or scratches. Subramanian recognizes the blood leaking out of Charlie's orifices as an indicator of a disease, and this prompts Rick to mention Violet, the deceased pig that he encountered a little while ago. Subramanian explains that diseases like the one that killed Patrick were spread by feral pigs and birds in the old days and Bob notes that they all thrive in close quarters, like the cell block. They conclude that everyone in the cell block could indeed be infected by the flu. Ryan realizes that he is dying, and asks Carol to take care of Lizzie and Mika for him as if they were her own. Carol agrees, but also tells him that he has to let them say goodbye to him, before she kills him. As Lizzie and Mika reluctantly do so, Carol tells them what she has to do, but Lizzie volunteers to do it instead. At the last minute she is unable to stab her father in the head and turns away crying as Carol takes back the knife and does it herself. Carol, Herschel, Daryl, Sasha, and Glenn think of what to do with the people who might have been infected, including a suggestion to quarantine them in cell block A, former death row. They then hear coughing outside of the room. It's shown to be coming from Karen, who was walking by with Tyrese. She is told that she must be quarantined in the tombs while they find out what the cause is. Sasha, as well as Karen herself, calms Tyrese, stating that it is necessary. As she leaves, Karen also mentions that David was coughing as well. Carl and Maggie are carrying Michonne back inside when Rick approaches them. He tells them what happened and assures Maggie that Herschel and Glenn seem to be fine. However, he says that they must stay away from him for now, due to him possibly being infected. Beth is then seen dressing Michonne's wound when the latter says that she made a mistake of letting the two walkers get the better of her. She bitterly says that Maggie and Carl should have left her. Beth says that she is being foolish. People getting hurt is part of living with a group. She muses about those who died, wondering what you call a parent who's lost a child. Michonne begins to tear up, but composes herself immediately and Beth doesn't notice. Later, she asks Michonne to hold Judith while she cleans up the mess Judith made on her. Michonne looks at Judith with indifference, but then loses control and weeps while holding Judith close, hinting that something horrible might have happened in her distant past. Carol goes to talk to Mika and Lizzie, as they stand by the fence. She turns to Lizzie and tells her that Ryan asked her to take care of them and says bluntly that Lizzie has become weak, 
and that in this world, she can't be. Lizzie begins crying about how they killed someone, and Carol realizes that she is referring to Nick, the walker that she named. Lizzie runs away and Mika explains that Lizzie is not weak, but messed up. Daryl is digging graves for those who had died when Rick comes by to assist. Daryl tells Rick that he's earned his time away from being in the position of a leader. Then, Maggie screams for them to follow her. It's shown that a massive group of walkers, possibly drawn by the gunfire from earlier, is converging at a portion of the fence that is about to give way. Despite the efforts of Glenn, Sasha and even a few others, there are just too many walkers. Sasha points out the carcasses of several dead rats, suggesting that someone has been luring the walkers to the fence, which explains why they are clustering together, instead of spreading out. Rick, getting an idea on what to do, tells Daryl to get one of the trucks. The two lead the walkers a few meters away and Rick pulls out one of the piglets. He then cuts its femoral artery and leaves it for the walkers to devour. He repeats this several times before the walkers are a safe distance away. Rick appears to be mourning as he kills each piglet, and seems to be significantly affected when the last piglet's blood splatters all over his face. Meanwhile, Carol finds Lizzie and Mika near the fence looking at walkers once again. Carol assures her that she needs to be strong in letting her father go and not to run away from her fear of the walkers but to face them. She puts a flower in Lizzie's hair. Lizzie takes the knife from Carol's hand, and proudly puts it in her belt. Carl finds his father about to burn up the pig pen. Rick explains that they either got the virus from the pigs or that we infected them. He then tells Carl that they need to stay away from Judith for a while to protect her from possibly getting infected. Carl then tells Rick about Carol teaching the kids how to use knives, but asks that Rick not confront her, as he believes she is right in doing so. Rick promises not to. He then pulls out his gun and holster and hands it back to Carl, as he now fully trusts that his son will use it for good. Rick lights several matches and burns the pigpen to the ground. Then, Rick takes off his bloody shirt and throws that into the fire as well. Tyrese is seen going to Karen's isolated cell in the tombs with some flowers in his arms, only to find her missing. He follows a trail of blood leading down the hallway to an outside door, where he sees the burnt corpses of both Karen and David. Karen is recognizable by her bracelet. The end of the first and second series. In the inner courtyard, Tyrese explains to Rick, Carol and Daryl how he found Karen and David's charred corpses. He came to see Karen, saw the blood trail on the floor, and it led him outside. There he discovered that both had been murdered in cold blood. Tyrese demands that Rick find who did it and bring the killer to him. When the latter tries to calm him down, he turns violent and attacks him, punching him in the face twice. Daryl holds him back, and Carol tries to stop Rick from retaliating, but it's too late. Rick charges at Tyrese, knocking him down and brutally beating his face. Daryl eventually pulls Rick off of Tyrese before it can go any further. Rick looks at his severely injured hand, horrified at what he just did. Doctor and Herschel are looking over a bite victim, who got his arm amputated. Unfortunately, the victim dies of blood loss. Doctor reluctantly prepares to put him down. Later, Herschel is seen bandaging Rick's hand. He comments on the group's situation, and that everything they worked so hard to keep out just found its way in, and briefs Rick on the flu situation. It is spreading, and another council meeting is to be held the next day to make a final decision as to what they should do. Tyrese is seen digging graves for Karen and David. Bob approaches him, telling Tyrese to go see Herschel and make sure he's all right. Tyrese firmly says that he will, but only after they are buried. Bob tries to change Tyrese's mind, but Tyrese glares at him and repeats, once they're in the ground, Bob then starts to help him dig. Glenn suggests to Herschel that, with Karen and David dead, the infection may have been cured after all. Sasha suddenly leaves C block, coughing violently. She assures Herschel that she will go to a block, where all the sick people are being isolated, to see Drive, who is revealed to be sick as well. At the meeting the following morning, the council eventually reach the consensus that they need antibiotics in order to start the treatment. Herschel mentions that there is an animal hospital facility that may have what they need and may have been overlooked by scavengers, however it's 50 miles away. Glenn starts to show symptoms of the flu. 
The sick are led into cell block A while Carol watches over them, wearing a mask for protection. Suddenly, Lizzie comes over and tells Carol that she is not feeling well. She asks if Carol can tuck her in, but Carol realizes that she might get infected. Heartbroken, Carol gives her a hug and sends her inside the cell block to Glenn, before tearing off her mask and sobbing. Outside, Carol is pumping the water, pointing out to Rick that the pump's intake hose, which is outside the fence, is sucking up mud. They agree that the next day they will go outside the perimeter to fix it. She suggests to Rick that he should talk to Tyrese, before heading back to the prison. Rick cautiously approaches Tyrese who is finishing the graves. He says that he's sorry for everything that happened. Tyrese congenially admits that there was wrongdoing on all sides. Rick then proceeds to ask him if Karen and David had any enemies or anyone who had a big problem with them. Tyrese fiercely denies this and then walks off, criticizing Rick for spending the day, looking at water pumps, instead of trying to find the murderer. In the cell block, Rick briefly talks to Carl to look over the office block, where the most vulnerable survivors, the young kids and the elderly, are being kept. Bob and Daryl fuel up a car, and Bob is disturbed when Daryl reveals that it was Zack's car. Back in a block, Tyrese, begins to post himself as guard to ensure that no one will try to kill them. Daryl asks him to join the run for medical supplies with Daryl, Michonne and Bob. He refuses at first, but Daryl is able to convince him otherwise, saying he'll help them more by getting the medicine than there, watching. He bids farewell to a sick Sasha, and leaves with the team. In the office block, Herschel decides to go into the woods, hoping to find elderberries to treat the patients. After a tense moment with Carl, who insists that he go along with Herschel, they reach an agreement wherein Carl goes out with him. Outside, Herschel comments that he'd be good without him, and remarks how peaceful it is out there. How safe is out there compared to the prison? Carl disagrees, pointing out to a nearby, severely decomposed walker, and soon one more shows up with an animal trap clamped to its leg. Carl prepares to shoot it, but Herschel stops him and tells him that he doesn't need to. Carl realizes that Herschel was correct and they leave the place with the elderberries, with Carl remarking how peaceful it was. Rick goes to the tombs and investigates the courtyard. He examines the blood trail and takes a closer look at the door. There is a bloody handprint on the door and Rick compares the print with his own hand. He notices that it is relatively small, compared to his own. This implies that the killer may have been female. Rick sighs and glances away. Arriving back at the prison, Maggie sees Herschel entering a block and warns him of the sick. Rick overhears the arguing and sides with Maggie. Herschel then proceeds to remind them of how they risk their life every day and every hour, no matter what they do. He says that it isn't their choice, the only choice being what they are risking it for. Stating that he can help the sick, Herschel pulls a bandana over his nose and mouth and enters the cell block. While driving towards the hospital for the supply run, the group hears a faint voice over the car radio repeating the word, Sanctuary. Sanctuary. Survive. Daryl is distracted by it, causing him to swerve several times and hit a few walkers on the road. He stops the car, shocked at the massive herd of thousands of walkers between them and their destination. Daryl drives in reverse and runs over several more walkers, which pile up under the car lifting the rear wheels and completely immobilizing it. The rear tires spin, splattering blood and gore onto the side panels, forcing them to abandon the car. Daryl, Michonne and Bob make it out and hold their own, but Tyrese stays behind, seemingly in a stupor. Bob's yelling eventually snaps him out of it, and Tyrese storms out of the car. In a rage, he ferociously begins to kill the walkers that are quickly surrounding him, yelling for the others to go as he is surrounded. After running in the woods for a while, the group stops to rest. They notice movement in the bushes. Tyrese emerges, covered in walker guts and blood, but alive and unscathed. They keep moving, as the walkers chase after them. Herschel gives Doctor the elderberry tea. Suffering heavily from the symptoms, Doctor coughs blood which sprays onto Herschel's face, including his unprotected eyes. Aware that he's most likely infected already, Herschel takes off the bandana and wipes his face. He also treats Glenn, giving him encouragement to keep pushing through. Outside, 
Carol sets up a noise-making distraction machine for the walkers while she sneaks outside the fence to fix the clogged water intake hose. Several walkers emerge from the forest behind Carol, while at the same time, a few of the walkers at the fence turn their attention towards her, leaving her no clear escape. Rick notices this and runs towards her. Carol hurriedly attempts to finish, but drops the fitting into the pond. Rick comes to her aid just in time. They both run back towards the fences and make it back inside. Rick tells her that they agreed to fix the hose tomorrow. We don't know if we'll get a tomorrow, Carol replies. Rick later confronts Carol in the courtyard, calling her actions from earlier, moronic. Carol half-heartedly agrees. As she begins walking away, Rick asks Carol if there's anything that she wouldn't do for the group. After she responds, no, he asks her if she killed Karen and David. After a moment, she replies calmly with a simple, yes. Carol tells Lizzie that she is going on a supply run with Rick. During the conversation, Lizzie tells Carol that no one dies, yet. Yet, Carol asks. Lizzie then explains what she will be if she survives. I'll be me, but I'll be different. Carol offers reassurance and reminds her that if something happens, she should run, until it's safe. She also says that both of them, along with Mika, will survive. Carol tells Lizzie to put her t-shirt behind her knife so she can get to it quickly. While this is happening, Lizzie responds, yes mom. Carol tells her not to call her mom probably because she lost her daughter and felt like she failed her. Meanwhile, Rick investigates the room where Karen was quarantined before being killed. Rick imagines Carol stabbing Karen in the neck and dragging her body down the hallway to be burned. Afterwards, Rick is seen getting ready for the supply run, along with Carol. The supply group is at a stream, discussing what they should do to secure a vehicle. Tyrese is washing his shirt in the water, noticeably absent from the conversation. Michonne mentions that they aren't far from Barnesville, and Daryl suggests that they go, as they will have a better chance of finding a vehicle there. He tells Tyrese that they are moving out, but he is ignored. Daryl and Michonne leave, but Bob stops and encourages Tyrese to come with them. He only responds by angrily lamenting that he doesn't know if his sister or anyone else is still alive. Bob says that regardless, it helps to keep moving. Tyrese disagrees, but stands up and starts walking. In the car, Carol mentions to Rick that Maggie wanted to come with them. Rick says that they needed someone to stay behind and stand watch. Carol replies with, someone you trust, you mean. She goes on justify her murder of Karen and David, saying that by doing so, she alleviated their suffering. Additionally, she hoped to prevent anyone else from getting sick. The supply group continues their search and finds an auto shop. After clearing some heavy vine growth, they find a minivan, which just needs a battery. As the group chops away at the overgrowth, Tyrese continues to grieve over Karen's death. He begins violently chopping at the overgrowth, which causes a door to pull open. Several walkers emerge, and the group struggles to dispatch them. Tyrese grabs a walker that is stuck in the vines, and refuses to let go. He eventually pulls it out, but the momentum causes him to fall backwards with the walker on top of him. Bob shoots it in the head before it can do any damage. Carol and Rick begin searching a house, and find several useful items. A walker comes out of a bedroom on the second floor, and starts walking toward them. However, it is unable to negotiate the stairs and tumbles down, almost landing on top of Carol. Rick pulls her away at the last second, after which she stabs the walker in the head. They start hearing noises coming from upstairs, like someone is moving around. Rick points his gun in the direction of the noise, after which a woman and man, Sam and Anna, emerge from their hiding place in an upstairs bedroom. They introduce one another, and Sam explains his dislocated shoulder. Carol fixes his dislocated shoulder. Rick asks them where they came from, and where they plan to go, followed by the three questions. Sam asks if they passed his test, but Rick doesn't answer. Instead, he suggests that they should wait in the house until he and Carol finish searching. Then after dark, they will circle around and come back to retrieve them. Rick gives Sam a watch, and says they will regroup in two hours. Carol disagrees, reasoning that Sam and Anna could help to widen the search grid. Even though Anna's leg is injured, and Sam's shoulder has just been realigned. While scavenging the veterinary college for medical supplies, 
Daryl and his supply group are ambushed by walkers. It appears that all of them died from the same flu-like disease that has swept the prison. Tyrese helps the group escape by throwing a fire extinguisher through the window and they all jump onto the roof of an outside walkway. Bob nearly loses his bag when it drops over the edge, but he manages to hold on to it. Daryl, however, finds that there is nothing in his bag but a bottle of liquor, which he attempts to throw away. Bob puts his hand on his holster, demanding Daryl not throw the bottle away. Daryl takes swift action, disarming Bob and grabbing onto him. Tyrese breaks them up, saying that Bob has already made his choice. Daryl says that they should have never allowed Bob into the prison group, and that he will beat him into the ground if he drinks even a sip of liquor before the ailing prisoners get the medicine. Rick and Carol then go to search other houses before going out to the yard to harvest some tomatoes, having a short conversation while doing so. As they continue to move, they suddenly find a basket with dropped food, and then find Anna's severed leg. In the distance, they see what is left of Anna being consumed by two walkers. Rick gives Carol her supplies, food, and a vehicle, before banishing her from the group, believing that nobody will trust her, including himself. Once they find out that she killed Karen and David, not to mention that Tyrese would try to kill Carol himself. Carol hands him a watch that Ed gave her on her anniversary to replace the one that he gave to Sam, before driving away. The end of the third and fourth series. Rick arrives back at the prison, and meets Maggie who is busy clearing walkers from the fence. Rick asks about Carl, but Maggie questions him on Carol's whereabouts. He tries to avoid the subject by asking another question, but she demands to know what happened. Rick breaks down, and tells her about Carol's dismissal from the group. He asks Maggie if she would have made the same decision, and she answers in the affirmative. However, she doubts that she could have committed to it. Before they part, Rick tells her to trust her instincts. He then heads to the administration building and slides a bag of food to Carl, avoiding close contact. Inside a block, things continue to worsen as more members get sick. Henry cannot breathe, so Herschel decides to intubate him, which allows him to be manually ventilated with an airbag. Sasha and Glenn take shifts pumping air into Henry's lungs, beginning with Sasha. Glenn and Herschel find Mr. Jacobson dead, with blood covering his face from his nose and mouth. Glenn reaches for his knife, intending to stab him in the head so he won't reanimate. However, Herschel stops him and says not to do it in front of everyone. Instead, they load him onto a gurney so he can be transported to a more isolated location. As Mr. Jacobson begins to reanimate, Herschel finds that he is unable to put him down. Glenn steps in and finishes the job. Later, Maggie comes to visit Glenn through the security window. Herschel stops her and says that he is resting, presumably because he doesn't want Maggie to see Glenn in his current state. Glenn is revealed to be just out of sight from the window, and he thanks Herschel for not allowing Maggie to enter the quarantine. Herschel begins closing everyone's cell doors, on the advice of doctor. A man storms out of his cell, and appears to be suffocating from the blood in his lungs. An extremely weak Sasha helps Herschel put him on a bed with wheels before she gets too weak to help him. He warns her to return to her cell, and brings the body to a separate room. Herschel prepares to stab to him in the head, but can't bring himself to do it. Instead, he puts a sheet over the man's face. Rick witnesses Herschel stab the man in the face and tells him of Carol. Herschel returns to the cell block, he continues closing the doors. However, Upon seeing a collapsed Sasha, he runs to her, leaving a cell with a female walker wide open. Herschel notices that Sasha has passed out due to dehydration, and successfully revives her. She tells him of how she used to calculate everything so she could live as long as possible, and expresses gratitude for his stupid behavior. Herschel resumes closing the cell doors, and notices that Norris and his son are passed out in the same cell. Norris insists on staying at his son's bedside, and locks the cell door behind him. Soon after, Glenn was pumping air for Henry, but he dies. When Glenn attempts to call out for help, he starts choking on his own blood and passes out. Lizzie finds him just as he is about to reanimate. Lizzie calls for help, which gets the attention of the female walker behind Herschel. The female walker jumps on Herschel and pins him against the floor. The father leaves his cell with a gun and his reanimated son follows him. 
a blonde woman comes to his rescue and pulls the walker off of Herschel, saving his life. However, the son attacks his father from behind, causing him to accidentally fire a gunshot that kills the woman. The gunshot echoes through the prison to Maggie and Rick who are fortifying the fence. Rick warns her to go help the people in cell block A. Meanwhile, Lizzie leads the walker away from Glenn as Maggie arrives and attempts to open the door without success. Herschel gets up and runs toward Lizzie, who gets pinned by the walker. He manages to throw the walker off of the catwalk. He sticks Lizzie in Luke's cell and he goes to get the shotgun from Caleb. However he has already turned. Caleb grabs Herschel as the female walker starts to move up the stairs. With sadness, Herschel breaks one of Caleb's arms and kills him. He proceeds to kill three walkers after leading them out of the children's sight. He realizes he needs the air pump to help Glenn and climbs onto the metal cage that the walker had landed on, but ends up getting pinned. Maggie heads to the visitor's room and smashes a window to get into a block. She kills the reanimated father and the walker pinning Herschel and the two head to help Glenn who has stopped breathing. Outside, the fence gives way and a horde of walkers get in. Rick and Carl run into the courtyard, where they get assault rifles and gun down the many walkers. Right after they finish, the van with Daryl, Michonne, Tyrese, and Bob finally returns. Daryl and Michonne run out of the van to go help, while Bob and Tyrese head to a block. Tyrese goes and cradles Sasha in his arms, while Bob goes to administer medication to Glenn. The next morning, Rick returns to his usual routine, splashing water on his face. He is about to go talk to Daryl when Carl comes along. Rick instead decides to spend time with Carl harvesting the garden. Herschel helps Michonne and Daryl load up the dead bodies. Daryl asks where Carol is, and Herschel avoids the question by telling him that she is fine but to talk to Rick about her. Michonne extends an offer to Herschel to join her, and he accepts. Outside, the governor is seen observing the prison from a distance. In a flashback, the governor flees after his massacre of the Woodbury army, alongside his two most trusted henchmen, Martinez and Schumpert. They later set up camp at the military outpost where they ambushed the National Guardsmen months earlier. The governor is sitting in front of a campfire when a female walker approaches him. She falls into the fire and proceeds to crawl towards him, but he does not react. Martinez then shoots her in the head. He notes that Philip doesn't even react to the walker approaching him or the subsequent gunshot. The following morning, the governor awakens to find himself alone, left to fend for himself. He drives back to Woodbury, smashing through the gates with a military truck, and burns down the entire town. The governor spends several months on the road. He has grown a thick beard and appears haggard and unkempt. As he passes a barn, he sees a series of messages painted all over it. Many are intended for someone named, Brian Harriet, pleading for him to come home. The governor continues onward, but exhaustion soon takes over. He begins to stagger then collapses on the street. As the governor lifts his head, he notices a little girl in the window of an apartment building. He pulls himself back to his feet and investigates. Once inside, the governor learns that a family, the Chamblers, has taken up residence in the apartments. There are two sisters, Lily and Tara, as well as Lily's daughter, Megan, and their ailing father, David. They are hostile at first and hold the governor at gunpoint. Rather than fighting, he quietly surrenders, holstering his gun and dropping it on the floor. This convinces the sisters that he means no harm, and they kindly lead him to one of the adjacent dwellings. Once they arrive, everyone sits down and the sisters start asking questions. The governor explains how he survived over the last several months, but Lily and Tara have more immediate concerns. They ask him how long he plans on staying, and he says, just for the night, as a precaution, Tara states that she used to be an officer with the Atlanta Police Department. She warns the governor that if he does anything to jeopardize her family's safety, she will shoot him dead. The governor confirms that he understands, which seems to put them at ease. Despite their brash introduction, Tara's trust in the governor seems to grow. This leads to an instance of poor judgment, in which she offers to return his gun. Lily quickly intervenes and manages to prevent the exchange. Her only comment to Tara is, not yet. The sisters pose one more question, in which they ask the governor for his real name. The governor identifies himself as Brian Harriet. 
At dinner time, Lily comes to the governor's room and offers him a plate of food, which he graciously accepts, but dumps out the window. Instead, he begins eating from a can of tuna that he found. The governor shows up later to return the plate, and he is invited inside. Philip sits down, and he watches Megan and David play a makeshift game of backgammon. After the two sisters try to help David get up, Philip carries the elderly man to his room. David asks Philip to do him a favor and get the chess set that Bill Jenkins, one of his war buddies, had in his apartment up on the floor above them. Philip ventures into the apartment, finding a wheelchair and eventually the chess set as well as some handgun ammunition. He then hears a noise from the bathroom and finds an undead, legless Bill lying in the tub. Philip mercifully kills Bill and notices a revolver in his hand, which he takes from him. He returns to the Chambler's apartment and gives David the game and leaves. The following morning, Lily comes by to give Philip his gun back and wakes him. When offered back his gun, Philip tells her to keep it and reveals the revolver that he found. Lily asks him for one more favor before he leaves. David has lung cancer and his current oxygen tank is nearly empty, so he needs a new one. She tells Philip of a nursing home located nearby and asks him to grab one or two. When Philip gets inside the nursing home, he finds that the undead patients are invalid, presenting no danger. Eventually, he finds a great bounty, a cart filled with many oxygen tanks. When he begins to leave, he encounters more walkers, but these are the reanimated able-bodied orderlies. After several struggles, he is able to escape the walker-infested nursing home, but with only two tanks. Lily thanks him and cleans a minor head wound that Philip received. She lets Megan stay and watch him while she goes back to their apartment. Megan asks Philip how he got the eye patch. Philip claims that he was a pirate and they both laugh. He says that he'll tell Megan the truth, but only if she doesn't tell anyone. Later, Philip is teaching Megan how to play chess when Lily reveals that David has died. Philip tells them to leave, but Lily wants another minute alone to say goodbye. David reanimates and nearly bites Tara but Philip is able to save them by bloodily bashing David's head with one of the oxygen tanks. After David is buried, Philip burns the old photo of his wife and daughter. That night, he goes to say goodbye, but Lily insists that he stays. Philip says that they can't go with him, but Lily reveals that she saw the photo of his family. She further admits that they aren't like his old family, but that Philip has become a part of theirs. They leave the building in David's food truck. After camping at a lake, their vehicle breaks down, forcing them to abandon it and continue on foot. Philip and Lily sleep together, beginning a relationship. Down the road, Tara ends up injuring her leg. Philip goes ahead and, seeing a group of walkers, orders them to drop their bags and run. While the rest flee, Megan is frozen in place and Philip convinces her to run to him. He then picks her up and leads the others through the woods. As they run across a clearing, Philip and Megan fall into a dugout pit and find several walkers inside. Megan cowers in a corner of the pit, while Philip kills the walkers with his bare hands. During this scene, gunfire can be heard in the background, but stops soon after the walkers are dead. Philip hugs Megan and swears on his life that he will keep her safe from anything that may harm her. I cross my heart, he tells her. He then hears a surprised voice coming from outside the pit. He looks up and sees a bewildered Martinez standing above him. Philip repeats, I cross my heart, as he strokes Megan's hair while staring up at Martinez. The end of the fifth and sixth series. Martinez looks down into the pit, and is startled to see a familiar face. Philip seems equally surprised, and holds Megan tightly. Martinez offers to assist them, so Philip lifts Megan over his head and into Martinez's hands. Two men, Mitch and Pete, ask Martinez if he knows him, to which he replies, yes. Martinez looks puzzled when Lily calls out to Philip as, Brian. He asks Philip if he's been on the road with the Chamblers the whole time, because no one has seen him or Shumpert since they left. Philip nods yes. Martinez then tells him that he and the Chamblers are welcome to join his group. However, there are two conditions. First, he, Martinez, in charge. Second, there can't be any dead weight. Philip agrees, and they journey to Martinez's camp. Later, Philip goes on a supply run with Martinez, Mitch and Pete. They are following a map made by one of the other camp survivors, 
when Philip notices something in the distance. As he gets closer, it is shown to be decapitated corpse that has been tied to a tree. A sign reading, Liar, is nailed into its chest. The group arrives at their destination, which is a cabin deep within the woods. As they approach the property, another headless corpse is found. It also has a sign attached to it, with the word, Rapist, scrawled in black ink. The group moves onto the porch, and heads toward the front door. Here they find yet another corpse, who apparently died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Unlike the others, its head is somewhat intact. The sign on its chest reads, Murderer. They cautiously move through the front door, with Philip in the lead. As everyone takes in their surroundings, they can hear a walker moving around in another room. It emerges out of nowhere, and Pete is ambushed and nearly killed, but was saved by Philip. He then notices the reanimated heads of the corpses outside the cabin. Another walker emerges and tries to bite Martinez, but Philip saves him as well. Afterwards, the four find supplies, as well as a six-pack beer. Pete wonders what drove a person to do something so horrible, but Philip suggests that they not dwell on it. Mitch then asks what Philip did for a living and what he did when the apocalypse first began. The latter dodges the question, simply saying that he survived. He then asks them the same question. The reveal that they both are brothers and served in the army at some point. When the apocalypse began, Mitch left and took his tank with him, while Pete was serving at Fort Benning and initially stayed to provide support, but soon left. While they were gone, Lily decides to form a makeshift nurse's station and helps bandage Alicia's hand. Tara notices Alicia's M4 carbine and remarks that while it's a good long-range weapon, it becomes cumbersome and unreliable due to dirt and debris. Alicia jokingly asks if she's always full of shit, and Tara says yes. Later on, the supply group returns and they share some beer with Martinez so tipsy that he almost falls when he tries to stand. Afterwards, Martinez tells Philip that he's got a surprise for him. On the roof of one of the RVs, Martinez shows Philip a golf bag full of clubs and begins to practice his swing, alternating with slugs from a liquor bottle. Philip remarks that he knew that Shumpert didn't survive and Martinez reveals that after they left, Shumpert got reckless and was bitten near one of the walker pits. He finishes by saying that he personally killed Shumpert out of mercy. He says that he's willing to share leadership responsibilities and offers to split them with Philip. Martinez comments that Philip's new family brought him back. He continues that he couldn't do it for fear of knowing that he'd lose them again. To Martinez's back, Philip replies, I'm not gonna lose them. To which Martinez gives a dismissive, yeah. Martinez offers to share the crown a little, referring to the leadership responsibilities of the group. Without warning, Philip smashes one of the golf clubs against the back of Martinez's head, then rolls him off the roof. Philip then drags Martinez over to one of the pits and is lowered towards the walkers, muttering, I don't want it. Repeatedly, he then lowers Martinez close enough to the walkers and watches as they drag a screaming Martinez down and devour him alive. Soon afterwards, Philip is seen crying and shaking inside his trailer as Lily and Megan come home. When she asks, he dismisses it as a bad dream. The next day, Mitch reveals to the rest of the camp that Martinez's remains were found and that he must have gotten drunk and fell into the pit. Pete then appoints himself as temporary leader of the group until they can properly vote on the matter in a few days. Pete then takes Mitch and Philip on another run. They come across another camp, and disagree on whether to attack the camp or not, but ultimately decide to leave. Later, they return to find the other camp in ruins with the inhabitants dead. Mitch is frustrated that they missed their chance to get the supplies, something that Philip secretly agrees with. That night, Philip tells Lily that they have to leave, due to Pete's inability to keep the camp safe. Philip, Lily, Megan, Tara and Alicia drive away from the camp to set out on their own but turn around when their path is blocked by a swarm of walkers stuck in mud. The next day, Philip goes to Pete under the ruse of wanting to talk about Mitch. Once inside, he then stabs Pete in the back and strangles him to death. Philip goes to Mitch and forces his way inside the trailer at gunpoint. He then blatantly reveals that he killed Pete, but forces Mitch to sit back down. He then tells Mitch that he's now in charge and agrees that they should have taken the other group's supplies. Philip explains how the hero 
doesn't always have the ability to make the right decisions for the group. Philip then organizes the survivors to form a rough perimeter around the camp and asks Tara to organize and catalog all their ammo. Later, Philip drags Pete's corpse along a dock and rolls it into the lake. Philip is seen marking a map when Lily comes by. When asked, Philip says that they need to move to a more secure location, hinting towards the prison, but Lily believes that their current location is safe enough. Later, Tara is on guard duty when Megan runs up and tags her, saying that she's now, it. Tara says that she can't play right now, but then tags her back and runs off. Megan runs around camp looking for Tara and finds a pair of legs standing behind the bedsheets on the clotheslines, thinking it's Tara. Megan runs over only to find a walker who lunges towards her. She runs away and tries to crawl under a trailer, but the walker grasps for her legs. Tara tries to pull the walker off, but the flesh strips from his leg and she's unable to get a good grip. It is only stopped when Philip shoots it in the head. Philip goes over to the lake and reflects on what he should do next. He stares into the water at Pete's undead corpse trying to reach him, but unable due to the weights chaining him down. He takes a truck and travels towards the prison. He arrives and looks at Rick and Carl digging in the prison yard. Jealous, Philip looks away and notices Herschel as well as Michonne disposing the dead from the recent Walker infestation. Seeing Michonne angers Philip, bringing back memories of her killing Penny, and he aims his gun at Michonne. The end of the seventh episode. Philip motivating his people to take over a nearby camp, the prison, for themselves. He is able to knock out Michonne from behind a tree and then holds Herschel at gunpoint with his 9mm Beretta 9.2SB nickel pistol, forcing the latter to drop his 9mm Glock 19 pistol. In the camp meeting, Philip explains that he captured two people from the prison. He says they can be used as leverage, lessening the possibility of anyone being killed. He fabricates a story to justify his plan, claiming that the people from the prison are the ones who mutilated him, burned down his former camp, and killed his daughter. Almost everyone in the camp agrees to take the prison for their own needs, but Tara and Lily are more reluctant. Lily walks out from behind a tree, having heard all of Philip's speech. She questions his motives. He repeats that most of the people at the prison are killers. She then asks him if she is with a killer, implying him. He tells her that his only concern is for her and Megan's safety. Philip once again confesses his deep love for Lily. But regardless, Lily's opinion of Brian seems to have changed. Philip then goes into an RV, where he is holding both Michonne and Herschel. He explains that kidnapping them wasn't personal as he intends to use them as bargaining chips in his bid to take the prison. Herschel tries to convince Philip that both groups can live together in peace. Philip, however, is obstinate and quite determined to carry out his plan. He makes it a point to tell them that he has no intent harm anyone, but Herschel voices doubt. He asks Philip how he can threaten someone else's daughters, when he once had one himself. Philip pauses, then coldly says, because they aren't mine. Lily and Megan, along with several other joyous children, and elderly people stay at a camp alongside a river to wait out the battle. She makes one last attempt to stop Philip from choosing to harm others at the prison, which proves futile. Philip converses with and hugs Megan goodbye, before she runs off to play in the mud. Back at the prison, Glenn and the other ill are recuperating. Glenn and Maggie share a moment and Glenn teases her about their upcoming anniversary. Now, knowing what happened to Carol, Daryl becomes furious, and he tells Rick that he could have at least waited until he and his group returned before a decision was made. Rick explains that she has a car and supplies, but Daryl is still upset, wondering what will happen to Lizzie and Mika. Rick adds that he couldn't bring Carol back to the prison because of Tyrese, who Rick believes would kill Carol given the opportunity. When Rick states that he hasn't told Tyrese yet, Daryl wants to find out how he will react and the two leave to find him. Elsewhere, Bob contemplates a box on the floor, probably containing liquor, but hides it when Sasha arrives abruptly. She thanks Bob for helping save her life. He defers that it was Herschel's work that saved her life. Tyrese then calls Rick and Daryl into the tombs, showing them the remains of a dissected rabbit's body, which reminds them of the rats that were found by the fences. Tyrese believes that the person who killed Karen and David is the same person that left the dissected rabbit there. Rick disagrees, 
but before Rick can tell him about Carol, the prison is rocked by an explosion. Running outside, they find Philip standing on the top of a military tank, surrounded by his armada of cars and armed survivors outside the prison fences. Philip demands that Rick come down to negotiate. Rick tries to refuse, stating that there is a council that makes the decisions now, but Philip then reveals that he has Michonne and Herschel held hostage, forcing Rick to come down and talk. The prison group prepares for the possibility of fleeing, as they seemingly no longer have the numbers to hold off the militia. They plan that, if their defenses fail, they will all get on the nearby bus and escape. Philip is quick to give Rick an ultimatum. Leave the prison by sundown or he will kill Michonne and Herschel. Rick counters that they have several ill people and children, but his pleas fall on deaf ears. Meanwhile, Daryl secretly begins handing out weapons and prepare for a war. By the river, Megan is still playing in the mud. Lily sees a walker trying to cross the river, but it gets swept away by the strong current. Megan then digs out a flash flood warning sign. However, she loosens the dirt just enough so that a buried walker is able to break through it. Lily runs to Megan's aid and shoots the walker with her 9mm Heckler Coke P9S pistol, but not before it is able to bite Megan on her shoulder. Philip handily shoots several oncoming walkers in the head, warning Rick that the sound will draw more of them in and that they'll be forced to leave soon. Carl notifies to Daryl that he has a good shot on the governor, but Daryl tells him not to take it because it could start a war for the third time, which they are obviously trying to avoid. Mika and Molly bring Judith out to put her on the bus, but Lizzie wants them to remember the fighting mindset that Carol had taught them and she believes that they should help. Rick tells Philip that the prison could definitely be shared, as per Herschel's advice, not after Woodbury, not after Andrea, Philip responds, which seems to fill Michonne with fury. Rick maintains that his group isn't leaving. And, just like Philip said, the battle between them would attract more walkers, and when they come, they'll tear down the fences and no one will be able to live at the prison. Infuriated, Philip jumps down from the tank and holds Michonne's katana to Herschel's neck, muttering that he will fix the damn fences. Rick pleads to Tara and the rest if a fight is truly what they want. I've fought him before and after. We took in his old friends. They've become leaders in what we have here. Now, you put down your weapons, walk through those gates, and you're one of us. We let go of all of it, and nobody dies. Everyone who's alive right now. Everyone who's made it this far. We've all done the worst kinds of things just to stay alive, but we can still come back. We're not too far gone. Rick says. Herschel smiles, knowing that Rick has found what he lost. We get to come back. I know we all can change. Rick continues. Philip thinks for a moment and starts to move the katana away from Herschel. However, Philip mutters, liar, before slashing the katana down, partially decapitating Herschel. Beyond enraged, Rick and the prison inhabitants open fire, while Carl manages to graze the governor in the arm. A bullet from the returning volley hits Rick in the thigh and he drags himself behind the overturned bus for cover. Taking advantage of the distraction, Michonne rolls away. She tackles one of the governor's militia to the ground and strangles him with her boot before proceeding to attempt to untie herself. A still alive Herschel attempts to drag himself away, but Philip uses the katana to chop at Herschel's neck until completely decapitated, to Beth and Maggie's horror from afar. Nearby, Tara is paralyzed by this brutal act as well. Just then, Lily walks up with Megan's corpse, witnessing Philip's act of murder. Upon seeing Megan's body, Philip becomes completely stoic. He takes Megan in his arms and shoots her in the head with his Beretta to prevent her from reanimating. Now with nothing to fight for, he gives another order to his militia. Go through the fences in your cars, get your guns, we go in. Kill them all. Mitch, in control of the tank, drives it straight through the fence and ultimately collapses it, destroying the crops in the process. The governor and some of his militia use the tank for cover, while the rest attack, invade the prison in cars and pickups. The third war officially begins. With the tank blasting holes on the prison's building's walls, the inhabitants begin evacuating to the best of their ability. Maggie and Beth oversee the movement of the elderly and the infirm to escape into the bus, before Maggie runs back into the prison to grab Glenn. Rick jumps out from behind the overturned bus and attacks Philip, 
which begins a brutal fistfight. Maggie and Glenn both arrive at the bus, but Beth is missing, having also left to find Judith. She leaves a protesting Glenn on the bus, telling him to leave if she isn't back in time. The tank tears down the fence leading into the courtyard, pinning Daryl in a corner. Walkers wandered in as well, and one of them attacks Daryl, who is focused on the militia. Rick and the governor are still fighting. The noise from the battle is drawing in even more walkers from outside the prison boundaries. Herds began to pour in through the destroyed fences, interrupting the battle between the two groups. Daryl uses the walker that nearly bit him as an effective shield. He grabs it and proceeds toward the hostels. After he throws out a grenade, Tara runs off from behind the tank. Maggie runs into Sasha and Bob, who are pinned down as well. Bob is shot through the arm, but since there is an exit wound, it can most certainly be treated. They see the bus leave without them, so the three of them flee as well. Tyrese is pinned down by Alicia and another soldier, but Lizzie and Mika arrive and shoot the both of them with Alicia taking a shot to the head. Tyrese tells the children that they have to get out, as walkers begin to fill the whole courtyard. The children run in the direction of the prison while Tyrese chases after them, yelling for them to go in the opposite direction. Rick is overwhelmed by Philip, who pins him down and brutally beats him before beginning to choke him to death. Suddenly, Michonne's katana blade bursts through Philip's chest, impaling him. She casts him aside and helps Rick up. Immediately, he asks about Carl's whereabouts, but she couldn't know. Rick wholeheartedly goes off to find him. Michonne takes one last glance at the dying Philip, and decides to leave him to die in agony. Daryl takes out a few walkers and manages to destroy the tank by dropping a grenade down the cannon barrel. Hearing the grenade rolling, Mitch bails out, but is quickly put down by Daryl, who sends a crossbow bolt through his chest. He runs into Beth, who was unable to find Judith. She wants to keep looking, but Daryl tells her that it's time to go. They then run away from the prison. A bloodied and bruised Rick stumbles back into the courtyard, where a few walkers appear. They begin to walk towards him, but Carl shoots them in the head. They search for Judith, only to find her bloody baby carrier, which brings them to the conclusion that Judith is dead. Infuriated, Carl takes out his rifle and shoots a walker repeatedly down to his last shell, before tearfully breaking down. The pair then limp off, away from the prison, which has been overrun by hordes of walkers, amongst them, a zombified Clara. Meanwhile, a dying Philip is still lying on the grass painfully, where Lily approaches him and shoots him in the forehead with his own pistol, ending the governor once and for all. Carl and Rick walk away from the prison, with Rick proclaiming, don't look back, Carl. Just keep walking, as herds of walkers stream in through the destroyed ruins. The prison became overrun, damaged beyond repair. End of Series 8 In a ruined prison, walkers surround a damaged tank. Then they show the corpse of the governor and the gnawed corpse of flame, and Michonne is behind the fences. She uses her katana to kill the approaching walkers, and takes cover behind the spikes of the gate. She then uses her old disguise technique and uses two trapped walkers as protection by tying them up with ropes and cutting off their jaws and arms. As she walks, she finds Herschel's zombified head and hits it with her katana, leaving the prison shaken. Carl and Rick walk along a country road, with Carl walking ahead of Rick, who has difficulty keeping up with him due to injuries sustained in the previous battle. First they stop at a barbecue restaurant, which seems to have already been looted. A lone walker is barricaded with several pieces of furniture. Rick wants to take him down with his axe, saving their ammo, but is too weak to deliver a killing blow, and Carl shoots him in the head, despite Rick's persuasions not to do so. On the floor, Carl notices a note left by the son of a walker who couldn't bring himself to kill his father. They search the buildings for supplies and finds a small cargo. Carl was able to get more things and jokingly tells his father, I won. Michonne and her walking pets are walking along the same road that Rick and Carl were walking, and she notices footprints in the mud. However, not knowing their owners, she decides to continue the journey alone. Rick and Carl keep walking until they take shelter in an abandoned house. After the investigation, Carl knocks loudly and swears to lure out the walkers, but Rick is angry at him for this. Carl snaps that he is not a child, and continues to clean the upper floor alone. He lingers in the children's room, looks longingly at the sports posters and the game system, 
and then pulls the cable out of the TV to secure the front door. Fixing the door, they argue about whether the knot is enough or whether the sofa needs to be pressed against the door. Carl angrily declares that his knot is good and gives Rick a verbal slap in the face, mentioning that Shane taught him this. Rick tells him that he remembers Shane every day and asks if Carl has anything else to say. Carl doesn't answer, and they push the sofa towards the door and turn it on its side. Rick goes to the bathroom at home and examines the bruises and scars on his body, one of which is a knife wound received from Morgan. In an apparent flashback, Michonne, her young son, boyfriend Mike and his best friend Terry are sitting at home and discussing the movie. It starts out as a normal conversation in Atlanta before the apocalypse, but as it continues, Michonne begins to understand the situation she is in. As she talks to Mike and Terry, the conversation turns into a conversation about survival in the camp they lived in. The world outside is gradually turning into a ruined Atlanta, and the condition of the room is becoming more dilapidated. They continue to talk, and then Michonne sees Mike and Terry with their hands cut off, and her son is missing. She starts screaming in terror, and then wakes up from a nightmare in a panic attack in the front seat of the car. In the house, Rick fell unconscious due to his injuries. Carl tries to wake him up, but to no avail. In frustration, Carl starts screaming, which alarms the two walkers outside. He lures the walkers away from the front door to kill them somewhere away from the house, but he is cornered by a third walker coming up from behind. However, after a frenzied shooting, he manages to kill all three walkers unharmed, repeating his comment to Rick. I won. Michonne continues walking through the woods. She is struck by the sight of a particular female walker, as she physically resembles her. Michonne shrugs, continues walking with the herd. When Carl returns from a supply trip, the sight of his unconscious father infuriates him. He condemns Rick for allegedly failing to protect a group of prisoners, and then blames him for what happened to Lori and Judith. Carl states that he never forgot how to survive, even when Rick wanted to play farmer. When his father doesn't answer, Carl says he doesn't need him anymore and he wouldn't care if he died. Carl goes on another trip for supplies to the neighboring house. At the top, he opens the door, behind which there is a walker. After a struggle in which he hit a walker with a pistol, he is almost bitten on the leg, but he manages to free himself when the walker pulls off one shoe from his foot. Carl closes the door, locking the walker in the room. He finds a piece of chalk and writes walking inside, took my shoes, didn't get me. Sitting on the roof of the house, he begins to eat a huge jar of chocolate pudding, and the walker leaned out of the window. As Michonne continues walking with the herd of walkers, she looks back at the walker who looks like her. It's as if an image of herself appears in front of her, like an animated corpse. In a fit of desperation, Michonne furiously slaughters the entire herd, including her doppelganger and pets. She returns to the road and begins to follow in the footsteps of Rick and Carl. Carl returns to the house, where Rick is still unconscious. Rick begins to move and moan, making Carl believe that he has turned. He grabs Rick's gun, but sobbing, he can't bring himself to shoot, declaring that he needs it. Rick falls to the floor and reaches for Carl's leg. Realizing that he doesn't want to be alone, Carla opens herself up to the seemingly zombified Rick. However, to Carl's great relief, Rika manages to shout out his name. Carl hugs his father's head and says, I'm scared. Michonne gets to the barbecue hut that Rick and Carl found earlier. She finds the note Carl found and sits down by the door frame. She says, Mike, I miss you and starts sobbing, but then she says she missed him even when she was with him. She continues to think about the camp and the loss of her son. She explains that Mike is not to blame for anything, and he could have been alive if things had gone differently. Then she says that she knows the answer to her problems, which is to let people into her life, not to shut them out. The next morning, Rick tells Carl that he shouldn't have risked going alone, but Carl assures him that he was careful. Rick congratulates Carl on finding more food and supplies. Then Carl says he ate some of the food. When Rick asks what it was, Carl replies that it was 112 ounces of pudding, which they laugh at. Rick explains that he understands that they will never be able to put everything back in its place. He explains that he took the time to become a farmer and create a community just for the sake of Carl and Judith. He then tells his son that he is now a man and that he is sorry that he treated him like a child, to which Carl objects and makes it clear that Rick was right to do what he did. Continuing to search for Rick and Carl, Michonne discovers a can of pudding that Carl ate, discarded on the street in front of their house. 
When she goes up to the porch, she sees them together through the window. She begins to cry with joy, and then looks up, as if thanking God. When she knocks on the door, Rick looks through the peephole and starts laughing at the sight of their friend. Then Rick turns to Carl and says, It's for you. Beth and Daryl are sitting by the campfire. Beth insists that they should not be the only survivors of the incident in prison. Daryl doesn't answer, and Beth yells at him. She suggests that since he is a tracker, they should track down the others. Then she goes alone into the forest. Daryl puts out the fire and slowly follows her. Later that day, Daryl finds a couple of footprints. Beth hastily assumes they belong to Luke or Molly. Daryl says that even if she's right, it doesn't mean that any of them are alive now. Beth, clearly disappointed by Daryl's disbelief, insists otherwise. As they leave, the camera turns to a log littered with bloody dismembered rabbit carcasses. Daryl and Beth find a bloody spot near the railroad tracks, where they are attacked by Christopher's revived father. Beth notices Cluck's shoe next to a pile of fresh human remains and bursts into sobs. Daryl begins to walk away, seemingly oblivious to Beth's grief. But then he stops and looks around with pity. Lizzie and Micah are walking through the woods behind Tyrese. When they stop to ask a question, Tyrese turns around, holding baby Judith in her arms. At nightfall, they find a clearing and decide to rest. Tyrese feeds Judith, and Lizzie sits on a nearby log, where two rabbits live. She takes out a knife and kills both of them. Suddenly they hear walkers in the distance. It seems that they are getting closer, which forces Tyrese and the girls to flee. The next morning, the girls find a vine and start picking the fruit. While Tyrese is changing Judith's diaper, Mika gets scared by the noise in the bushes and runs away. Tyrese and Lizzie give chase and a few minutes later finds Mika hiding behind a tree. While the group gathers their thoughts, they hear screams in the distance. Tyrese directs the girls back to back, tells them to keep an eye on Judith, and he says he has to investigate. If walkers appear, they should start running towards him. Tyrese stumbles upon an attack by walkers at the railway tracks. Two men, Christopher and his father, are fighting off a group of walkers. Tyrese comes to the rescue, but cannot prevent their death. Then he hears gunshots in the nearby forest. Several walkers approach Nika and Lisa. Nika screams to get her sister's attention, but Lisa is terribly focused and doesn't notice anything. She stares at Judith and presses her hand to Judith's nose and Mercury to calm her down. When Tyree starts coming back for the girls, the three of them and Carol come out of the bushes. Before his death, Christopher's father tells Tyrese about the shelter located up the rails. Maggie, Bob and Sasha are in the woods near the quarry. Maggie sharpens a knife on a rock, and Sasha bandages Bob's hand. Sasha tells Maggie that they should camp there for the night. Maggie agrees that Bob and Sasha should stay there, but declares that she is going to go in search of Glenn herself. Sasha insists that they stay together, but Maggie is defiant, saying that she has already made her choice. She starts to leave, and Bob and Sasha follow her. The three of them stumble upon a prison bus. It turns out that the refugees from the prison did not survive the evacuation, they died and came to life after being hit and killed by bullets that hit the bus, which caused a mini-explosion inside the bus. Maggie tells the others that she has to check if Glenn is inside. After Bob says they will do it together, Sasha reluctantly agrees and opens the emergency exit to release the walkers one by one so they can be easily put to sleep. Eventually, the walkers overcome control with Sasha over the door and break out. When the walkers attack, Bob and Sasha defend themselves, and Maggie is petrified. However, Maggie becomes enraged, starts killing walkers, even smashes a female walker's head on a bus, and then stabs her. Then Maggie gets on the bus to check if Glenn is there and after killing a zombie teenager who is stuck under a dead woman, sits down and starts crying with relief. Glenn wakes up in a section of a ruined prison passageway, almost hanging over a crowd of walkers, several of whom, prison inmates killed during the attack. It looks like he got off the bus to look for Maggie before he left and was on the footpath when a tank shot at him, knocking him down. He shouts to Maggie and looks for her. He collects some supplies and clothes, including a bottle of Bob's brandy. After that, he makes his way through the walkers, dressed in riot gear. When he gets out, he sees Tara, who has locked herself in a small fenced place. Glenn stabs a walker who reaches for her before going inside. He quickly takes her weapon, checks the cartridges and sees that she did not shoot during the siege. 
He tells Tara that it's time for them to leave. After Tara refuses him, he asks her, will you just stay here and just die? Tara replies that she joined the attack on the prison, and Glenn replies that he knows and asks her for help. Glenn grabs a bottle of Bob's brandy and uses it as a Molotov cocktail, which he throws into a nearby car. While the walkers are attracted by the flames, Glenn and Tara escape from the prison and get to the road next to the prison bus. On the way, Tara remembers that she witnessed the events related to the death of her sister during the storming of the prison. She tells Glenn that she shouldn't have been there and that he killed the old man, Glenn asks if it was Herschel, and Tara replies I'm sorry. And she tells him that the governor told her that they were bad people, and she understands that this is not true. Glenn tells her that he needs to find Maggie, and Tara asks if she got there. Glenn replies that he doesn't know and tells her that Herschel was a great man who taught Glenn to believe. Glenn uses this as a reason to believe that Maggie is alive. After being attacked by a small group of walkers, Glenn falls, leaving Tara to kill the walker alone. She looks up and sees a military truck shouting that they liked the show. Three people get out of it, Abraham, Eugene and Rosita. Tara sits in the back of Abraham's military truck and writes the name of the streets on her hand as the truck drives past them. They stop at the wreckage of the car, three walkers nearby start hitting the back of the truck. Tara is about to shoot them with a rifle when Abraham orders her to stop. He keeps attacking them with a crowbar, one by one, until they all fall down. Tara notices this and tells him that she sees him smiling for the first time. He replies that it's because I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Michonne and Carl sit down for breakfast over a bowl of cereal. When Michonne says that she would like to drink soy milk, Carl replies that it is disgusting and that he would rather drink Judith's mixture. Reminding himself of the unknown fate of his sister, he abruptly leaves the table. Michonne tells Rick that they are going to go for supplies. Rick offers his services, but Michonne tells him that he needs to rest. Rick gives Carl his colt and gives him and Michonne until noon to get back. Then Rick goes upstairs and falls asleep on the bed. After they have cleared the first house, Michonne tries to cheer Carl up by eating a huge amount of crazy cheese and pretending to be a walker. When Carl fails to make her laugh, she says that she is good at making babies laugh. This prompts Carl to ask when she was around the babies. Michonne replies that she had a child before the apocalypse, which surprises Carl. Rick wakes up from sleep after hearing the noise of people on the lower level of the house. Hearing approaching footsteps coming up the stairs, he dives under the bed, finding a bottle of water and a book there. A survivor named Tony sits down on the bed, circling it several times, and soon falls asleep. Michonne and Carl continue to clear the house. Carl convinces Michonne to tell him that her baby's name was Andre Anthony. Michonne finds a children's room, inside which is the entire deceased family. Shocked, Michonne slams the door, sees Carl standing outside, and lies to him that there was a dead animal inside. Carl seems to see through the lie, but does not insist on his own, and they stand together in the room. Maybe Andrew Judith is somewhere together, says Carl Mitchin. Len enters the room with Rick, who is still hiding under the bed. After an argument about who will sleep on the bed, Len throws Tony off the bed by force, and a fight begins. At some point, Tony closes Rick's eyes, and Len strangles him, and he loses consciousness before he can say anything. The second survivor, satisfied, leaves his friend on the floor and goes to sleep on the bed. Glenn wakes up in the back of Abraham's truck and Tara tells him about the situation. Abraham refuses to stop the truck until Glenn starts pounding furiously on the back window. Glenn tries to leave, but Abraham tells him that he is interfering with the mission. After Glenn asks about the mission, Abraham informs that Eugene knows exactly what caused the apocalypse to begin and that government officials should meet with him in Washington. Glenn tries to leave anyway, and after Abraham tries to get him to stay, Glenn punches him. Abraham jumps on Glenn and they fight. Meanwhile, Eugene sees the walkers approaching and takes it upon himself to try to kill them. Due to poor aiming and poor gun control, he scatters bullets, some of which burst the fuel tank of the truck. Abraham and the others kill the walkers, and Glenn goes old to the bus. Abraham, after a moment's hesitation, follows them. While Len is sleeping, or else not out, Rick leaves the room and tries to leave the house, but Lou notices him. After a short, brutal fight, Rick strangles Lou to death and takes possession of his submachine gun. Leaving the bathroom door slightly ajar, 
presumably so that his revived corpse could attack the others. Then he gets out through the window and walks along the edge of the house. He sees the leader of the group, Joe, sitting on the porch, and is about to kill him when he hears the screams of Harley inside, who is attacked by a revived Lou. When Joe runs inside to help, Rick sees Michonne and Carl coming back from a run. He runs to them and directs them away from the house. As they walk, Carl offers Michonne some crazy cheese, and she laughs, and Rick gives them a puzzled look. They are walking along the railway tracks and notice a sign. After a short discussion, the trio decides to go where the sign points. The sign says, shelter for all, those who stay, survive. Terminus. In the middle of the night, Daryl and Beth find an abandoned car on the side of the road. They climb into the trunk and spend the night in it while numerous walkers pass by. The next morning, they search the car for supplies, and then leave. Later, Daryl hunts for food, and Beth makes a fire in the camp they set up. After an unsuccessful attempt to catch a squirrel, Daryl manages to kill a large snake. He brings her to the camp, where he and Beth cook and eat her. After finishing her meal, Beth tells Daryl she wants a drink. He gives her a bottle of water, but she tells him she wants a drink, explaining that Herschel did not allow it. When Daryl doesn't say anything, she angrily takes her knife and leaves. While Beth wanders through the woods, walkers appear, and she has to hide. She successfully tricks walkers by throwing a stone into the nearest thicket, distracting them. Daryl then appears and leads her back to the camp, which angers her. Beth indignantly tells Daryl that she can take care of herself, and pushes him away for good measure. However, they leave the camp together and stumble upon a golf course. A group of walkers appears from the woods, and Beth decides to go to a country club on the edge of the golf course, believing there is alcohol there. Going inside, they find three walkers suspended from the ceiling by their necks, and the bodies of people with shot heads are scattered on the floor. While Beth is looking for alcohol, Daryl starts collecting money scattered on the floor. Walkers from the golf course try to enter the room and force them to seek refuge in the depths of the club. As they make their way deeper into the building, Beth manages to find an unopened bottle of alcohol. However, a walker attacks her from the shadows, and she is forced to use a bottle as an improvised weapon. The bottle breaks, but she manages to stab the walker in the head. She sees Daryl watching her and sarcastically thanks him for his help. Daryl just reminds her that she said she could take care of herself. Beth notices the inscription Welcome to Doc Trot on the wall and sees even more bodies of people who, like the others, apparently committed mass suicide. Further in the building they find a shop. Daryl tries to plunder the cash register and starts taking everything that could have monetary value before the plague. Beth approaches and they both see the upper half of the female corpse. The corpse is deliberately mounted on mannequin legs, his shirt is unbuttoned, and a sign with the inscription Rich Bitch is pinned on his chest. Beth seems upset by the sight. She asks Daryl to help her clean it up. He first says it doesn't matter because the woman is dead. However, he then decides to throw a sheet over the corpse. Meanwhile, Beth finds a clean shirt and puts it on. While they continue their search, the grandfathers on the clock, which they passed earlier, begin to ring. This attracts the attention of all walkers nearby. Daryl and Beth try to escape, but they soon find themselves at a dead end. Daryl begins to deal with the walkers with his crossbow, until one of the walkers clung to him. Then he starts getting rid of them with a golf club and a knife until he gets to the last one. In a fit of anger, Daryl deliberately hits a walking man with a golf club without killing him, and then smashes his face. In the process, Beth's shirt is splattered with blood. She takes it off and they go to the bar. Beth starts looking for alcohol while Daryl continues packing. Beth finds a half-empty bottle of peach schnapps and asks Daryl if he's good. He says no, but she seems determined to drink it anyway. Not finding a clean glass, Beth begins to cry, and Daryl angrily approaches the place where she is sitting and breaks the bottle on the floor, saying that her first glass will be better. He then takes her to a dilapidated shack that he claims he found with Michonne. He goes into the house with Beth, takes out a box of moonshine from it and pours her a glass. Beth drinks moonshine, then offers to drink to Daryl, but he refuses, saying that someone needs to have their own mind. Beth persuades Daryl to play the game I Never, during which Daryl gets drunk. Beth says she's never been to prison, implying that Daryl has been. He gets furious and starts urinating on one of the walls. He then forcefully takes Beth outside, where a walker was brought to the house to teach her how to use her crossbow. He shoots the walker in the chest, 
pinning him to a tree, and tries to get Beth to kill him with a crossbow. She refuses and instead stabs him in the head with her knife. Then they start arguing, during which Daryl yells at Beth for getting lost on the road and only wants to drink like a stupid student, and Beth demands that Daryl stop pretending that he doesn't Later in the evening, Daryl and Beth share stories about their families, during which Beth tells Daryl that he will eventually be the last one left alive after everything is over. Daryl says that before the apocalypse, he followed his brother Merle and did what he said. Beth offers, we have to burn him to the ground, help Merle smiles and tells her that they will need more alcohol. They pour moonshine all over the house and prepare to set it on fire. Daryl offers Beth matches, and she sets fire to the money that Daryl collected earlier and throws them into the house. The house starts to burn, and Beth and Daryl, watching it garange, turn and leave. Bob, Sasha and Maggie are surrounded by walkers in a thick fog and fight them off. During the fight, one of the walkers almost bites Bob, which scares Sasha. After they fought off the walkers, Sasha helps Bob, and they both see that the walker did not bite Bob but only tore his bandages. A relieved Sasha hugs Bob. In the present, Daryl teaches Beth how to track down and use a crossbow. Beth finds the tracks and correctly determines that they belong to a walker. Daryl notices that she's getting better at it. They approach a clearing where a walker is feasting on the corpse of a small animal. Beth tries to approach the walker to shoot him with Daryl's crossbow, but her leg unexpectedly falls into an animal trap. The walker notices her. She shoots a crossbow, but the bolt hits the walker's mouth, skipping the brain. However, the walker is quickly killed by Daryl. Sasha, Bob and Maggie agree that they need to find a more suitable place to camp, since the clearing they are in is covered with fog. Maggie takes a small compass out of her pocket and tries to use it, but is upset to learn that it is broken. Bob says they don't need it, referring to the fact that the sun the east and sets in the west, which means they can use it to determine which way to go. Daryl helps Beth walk through the woods until they find a cemetery with a large house towering over it. He then carries Beth on his back through the cemetery. Halfway there, Beth gets off and starts looking at a 19th century tombstone with the inscription Beloved Father. Daryl also looks at him, then takes out some flowers from the ground and puts them on the tombstone. Beth takes Daryl's hand to hold it. Both are silent, but you can see how their hands are clenching. Maggie, Sasha and Bob find railroad tracks as well as a sign advertising the Terminus community. Bob tells them about the program that he, along with Tyrese, Daryl and Michonne, heard on the radio while searching for medicines for the surviving prisoners. Maggie immediately demands that they go to the community, as this is a likely place where Glenn could have gone. Sasha disagrees, saying that perhaps there are no other signs that Glenn could see. Bob, however, agrees with Maggie, and Sasha is forced to agree with them. Daryl and Beth explore the funeral home in the cemetery. Beth immediately noticed how clean the inside was. Daryl guesses that someone lived in it. As they explore, they find many bodies dressed as for funerals, and a coffin. Beth says it's very beautiful, referring to the fact that whoever dressed them up wanted to bury them properly. She then turns to Daryl, asking if he thinks it's beautiful, to which he stares at her in silence for a few seconds, and then walks over to her to wrap his arm around her ankle. Maggie's group set up camp, setting up clippers and noise alarms to warn them of the approach of walkers. Bob asks Sasha where Maggie is, and she replies that she is collecting firewood. Bob asks Sasha if she wants to stop, to which she replies in the affirmative. When asked why, she answers that she wants to survive. She tells him that Glenn is most likely dead and that they need to stop in the first town they come across and settle there. Daryl and Beth search the kitchen of the house and find a large supply of food and drinks in the cupboards. Daryl notices that there is not a speck of dust on them, which means that someone put them there recently and that someone really lives in the house. They install clippers to warn if someone comes. At night, Beth sings and plays the piano in the house, and Daryl watches her and secretly eavesdrops on her. When she discovers him, Daryl goes and lies down in the coffin they found, saying it was the most comfortable bed he slept in and then asks her to play some more. 
Sasha wakes up and finds a note in the ground left by Maggie, who secretly left in the middle of the night. Bob insists that they follow her, and that if they follow the railroad tracks, he will catch up with Maggie. As Maggie walks along the railroad tracks, she comes across another terminus sign. A walker is approaching her. She lets him get close to her and easily kills him. Then she cuts open the insides of the walker. Sasha asks why Bob smiles all the time after prison, and asks if he even knows what he is smiling at. Bob replies that he is not alone, referring to the fact that he was alone after his first two groups were destroyed, and that he finally broke this streak. They then find the walker that Maggie killed, and find in the walker's blood a message left for Glenn, in which she asks him to go to Terminus. Daryl carries Beth to the kitchen, where there is food on the table, and they start eating. They stop when he hears a noise outside. Daryl asks Beth to step aside when he goes to look. Opening the front door, he discovers a one-eyed dog on the porch. He tries to pet her, but the dog runs away in fear. Beth asks if the dog will enter the house, to which Daryl is upset that she did not stay away. Beth says it's just a dog, and seems upset that she won't come in, to which Daryl replies that maybe she'll come back later. In the middle of Bob's night there will be the sound of walkers. Sasha has already woken up and calmly says that he has been making noise for about an hour, which leads Bob to think that he is hooked on something. Sasha offers Bob a break, but he can't. Instead, he asks her why she thinks Tyrese is dead, saying that if Tyrese was alive, he would have gone to Terminus, and that she knows it. Beth writes a thank you note to the person staying at the house for the food she and Daryl ate. Daryl suggests that she not leave her, but wait until the owner returns and tries to live with them. Beth asks that she convince Daryl that there are still good people in the world, but he doesn't answer. They hear a dog barking, and then it starts screaming in pain. Daryl goes to the door and is immediately attacked by a horde of walkers hiding behind the door. He keeps the door closed and Beth gives him her crossbow, then they both try to escape. Daryl convinces Beta to go through the window while he distracts walkers. After leading them through the house, bending them into a corner, Daryl manages to escape to the cemetery, where he destroys two more walkers, finds Beth's discarded bag lying on the floor, and, to his alarm, sees a black car with a white cross driving away, assuming that it was stolen. Daryl tries his best to run after the car, but eventually loses it at the intersection. Sasha and Bob find another message for Glenn, written by Maggie in the blood of walkers. Bob claims that Maggie is really close to the train tracks and that if they accelerate, they will be able to catch up with her. Daryl is still running in the direction the car left, but he's already starting to get tired. Finally, after several hours of alternating running and walking, he falls at the intersection of railway tracks and an asphalt road, shown extremely saddened and exhausted. Bob and Sasha stumble upon an empty town near the railroad tracks, and Sasha tries to convince Bob that they should set up camp in it. Bob refuses, wanting to find Maggie, and Sasha tries to convince him to stop following her, saying that Maggie didn't want them to go with her. Bob replies that he doesn't care and that he's going to find her and help her. Unable to convince Sasha to go with him, he kisses her goodbye and they break up. Sasha enters the old building and searches it from the inside. Having come to the conclusion that everything is clean, she begins to cry, but quickly pulls herself together. Then she goes to the window and is shocked to see Maggie lying among the corpses on the ground. Accidentally, the window through which she is looking falls, breaks on the ground and scares Maggie. This also leads to the appearance of several walkers, and Sasha quickly goes to Maggie's aid. After they deal with the walkers, Maggie asks Sasha where Bob is, and Sasha replies that he is looking for Maggie. Maggie then confronts Sasha and reveals that she heard Sasha tell Bob that Glenn is most likely dead and says she is wrong. Maggie asks Sasha to help her get to Terminus, to which Sasha agrees. Then they leave to catch up with Bob. Daryl is surrounded by six men, well armed with machine guns and a bow. Before they can say anything, he jumps up and hits one of them, aiming a crossbow at his head. This man, the one Rick almost killed when he broke into the house he claimed with Carl and Michonne. The men point their guns at Daryl, one of them demands to take his leather vest, but the man Daryl knocked down tells them not to shoot. He then starts talking to Daryl, saying that he admires Daryl's crossbow and would like to have one of the same. He then tells Daryl that if Daryl shoots him, the rest of his group will kill Daryl, telling him it would be suicide, and asks why he would hurt himself if he could hurt other people.
He then introduces himself to Joe. Daryl slowly lowers the crossbow and introduces himself to the man. Joe's group lowers the weapon. Maggie and Sasha catch up with Bob and, united, continue their journey to Terminus. Elsewhere, Glenn finds the Terminus sign and looks at it in awe. Carol and Lizzie watch at night while Tyrese and Micah sleep on the train tracks. Lizzie asks Carol if she has had children before. Carol replies that she had a daughter who didn't have a single evil bone in her. Is that why she's not here right now? Lizzie asks. Carol nods. The next morning, Tyrese calculates that they are several days away from Terminus. When they follow the tracks, Carol tells Tyrese that she is worried about the girl's survival, believing that Mika is too soft, and Lisa does not understand what a walker is. Carol and Tyrese smell smoke and note that there must be a bonfire burning nearby. Carol and Micah go in search of water, and Tyree lies down on his injured arm. The walker moves towards Tyrese and Lisa, but falls into a gap in the rails, falling into a trap. While Tyrese prepares his hammer, Lizzie begs him to keep the walker alive. Sometimes they have to be killed, she admits, but sometimes not. Meanwhile, Carol urges Micah to get tougher. Mika insists that she can kill walkers, but she won't kill people because it's wrong. Carol says Mika will die if she doesn't change. They find a house in the middle of a walnut grove. Carol suggests they stay there for a couple of days. Carol and Tyrese check the house for walkers while the girls wait outside with Judith. Lizzie is afraid that the adults will find the walker inside and kill him. They are inhumans. Reproaches Mika, to which Lizzie does not agree. The walker attacks Lizzie and Mika, and Mika shoots him. Carol and Tyrese run outside to check on the girls. When Lizzie cries for the dead walker, Mika calms her down by telling her to look at the flowers and count to three. In the evening, the group sits by the fireplace in the living room. Tyrese watches the peaceful scene and expresses satisfaction. Mika suggests they make the house their home. The next day, Carol sees Lizzie playing in the yard with a walker, whom Lizzie calls Griselda. She runs out into the street and kills him with her knife. She's my friend, and you killed her. Lizzie screams. Carol says that the walker wanted to kill Lizzie, but Lizzie refuses to listen. While hunting in the woods, Carol tells Mickey that she is smarter than her sister when it comes to walkers. They notice a deer. Mika aims the rifle, but in the end can't pull the trigger. Carol looks disappointed at this. Collecting well water with Carol, Tari suggests that they live in the house, and not go to Terminus. I trust you, he tells Carol, admitting that he is not ready to be with other people yet. Mika finds Lisa feeding a mouse to a walker stuck on a railway track and makes remarks to her. They just want me to change, to become the same as them, insists Lisa. When she reaches for the grinning mouth of a walker, new walkers appear from the forest. Mika grabs Lisa and they run away. Tyrese and Carol hear the girls' screams and discover that they are being chased by a pack of walkers. All four of them line up and exchange fire with the walkers. In the evening, Carol asks Lisa if she has finally understood what a walker is. Now I know what I need to do, Lisa replies. It's ugly, scary and changes you, says Carol, but that's how we ended up here. The next day, Carol and Tyrese are hunting together in the woods. Carol is warm to Tyrese's idea of living in the house permanently. Tyrese then confesses that he is haunted by nightmares about Karen and the man who killed her. Carol and Tyrese arrive at the house and find Lizzie standing over Mickey's corpse with a bloody knife in her hand. Judith is lying on a blanket nearby, still alive. Don't worry, she'll be back. He tells Lisa about his sister. I didn't damage her brain. Lisa also states that she was going to do the same with Judith. Carol and Tyrese try to disarm Lisa, but she points a gun at them, insisting that they have to wait until Mika wakes up. Carol takes the gun away from Lizzie and dissuades her from harming Judith. Tyrese brings Lisa and Judith into the house. Left alone, Carol sobs, and then pulls out a knife to lay Mika down. That evening, Tyrese says that he found out that Lizzie was feeding walkers in prison, and they wonder if Lizzie killed Karen and David. It wasn't her. Carol says, doubting Lizzie would let them transform. Tyrese offers to leave with Judith to protect her, but Carol sees only one option for Lizzie. She can't be around other people, she says, implying that Lizzie should be killed for her own safety. Carol takes Lisa out for a walk while Tyrese watches her from the window. Please don't be angry with me. I didn't mean to point a gun at you, Lisa wails, sensing Carol's mood.
Carol tells Lisa to look at the flowers and pulls out her revolver. Carol pulls the trigger of the revolver back and after a moment pulls the trigger. After that, Carol and Tyree dig graves for the girls in front of the house. That night, Carol gives Tyrese her revolver and confesses that she killed Karen and David. I had to stop the disease, she explains, offering him to do whatever he needed. Tyrese grabs the table, trying to contain her anger. I forgive you, he finally says. But I will never forget, he continues. It's a part of you now. The next day, Carol and Tyrese leave the grove with Judith and resume their journey along the railroad tracks. Abraham, Glenn, Tara, Rosita and Eugene walk along the railroad tracks. Eugene talks about video games, and Tara hands Eugene a metal object that, in his opinion, can be used to make a homemade battery. Tara and Glenn stumble upon messages about Terminus, which Maggie had previously left for him. Believing she is still alive, Glenn runs ahead of the group. Joe's group, without Daryl, are at Bob and Sasha's old camp. They were woken up by a walker who got stuck in the wires. After killing the walker, the group notices that Daryl is not with them. Len notices that Daryl's things are still in the camp, and goes in search of him. Rick, Carl and Michonne are on another section of the railway track. Carl and Michonne walk along the rails to see who will last longer in balance. Michonne tries to scare Carl to win the bet, but accidentally falls herself. Carl chooses one of the last two candies in stock. Choosing a chocolate bar with the image of a big cat, he shares it with her. Meanwhile, Daryl is hunting when Len appears behind him. They both shoot and kill the rabbit. Len takes the rabbit and argues with Daryl until they are interrupted by the marauder leader Joe. Joe explains to Daryl that the band has one rule, if they need something, they demand it. He then cuts the rabbit in half for Daryl and Len, since the former did not know about this rule. Glenn's group stumbles upon a building where they see a walker on one of the upper floors. He stumbles towards them, gradually approaching the open ledge. Fearing that he will fall and fall on Eugene, Abraham pushes him out of the way. At the same time, Tara accidentally falls to the ground and gets a leg injury. Abraham demands that everyone rest, but Glenn insists on continuing. They come to a compromise Glenn gives his equipment to Eugene. In exchange, Abraham agrees to escort Glenn and Tara to Terminus. As they walk along the tracks, Joe persuades Daryl to stay with them. He explains that membership in the group implies compliance with certain rules. For example, if a group member steals from the group or lies to another member, he will be punished with a severe beating. The group finds a garage, and Joe announces that they will stay there overnight. Turning to Daryl, Joe remarks that there is nothing sadder than a street cat who thinks she is a room cat. Joe talks about people like us, but Daryl replies, there are no us. Joe slowly turns to face Daryl and asks if he's going to leave. Daryl doesn't say anything, to which Joe responds. No, then it looks like there's us. He walks towards the building and Daryl reluctantly follows him. Glenn's group comes to a long railway tunnel and finds another sign written by Maggie. Believing she has passed through him, Glenn says he intends to follow her. Abraham points out the obvious danger, especially when they hear walkers moving around inside. Concerned that he cannot guarantee Eugene's safety in the tunnel, Abraham decides that they should split up. He leaves Glenn and Tara with two cans of food and a large lantern. Glenn promises that they will retreat and try to catch up with Abraham's group if they run into trouble. Entering the tunnel, Glenn and Tara discover several walkers trapped by the debris of the collapsed roof. In search of a working car, Abraham finds a minivan with a zombified woman inside. After killing her, Abraham discovers that the car is still running. On the windshield of the car, someone wrote the dust lat momo by, referring to the zombified woman in the back seat. Abraham uses the wipers to erase the inscription looking slightly worried. After a playful argument, Eugene manages to convince Rosita to let him drive the car. Glenn and Tara are watching the numerous walkers in the tunnel. They decide to climb over a pile of debris blocking the tunnel. Shortly after they partially made their way through the tunnel, Tara got her foot caught on loose stones, and Glenn looks back in horror. Eugene drives the car while Rosita drives and Abraham takes a nap in the back seat. When she complains that Eugene is lost, she realizes that they are not on the other side of the tunnel. Eugene tells Rosita about his plan to wait for Glenn and Tara on the other side of the tunnel before continuing on. Eugene happens to be Abraham, who is furious at Rosita for stopping for some reason. 
While Abraham and Rosita are arguing, Eugene sees something in the direction of the tunnel. After Joe's group spends the night in the garage, where everyone except Daryl demands a car for the night. Forcing him to sleep on the floor, Daryl wakes up to Len accusing him of stealing his half of the rabbit. Joe throws out Daryl's bag and finds half of Len's rabbit. Daryl tells the group that he was framed. After Len asks again if Len framed Daryl, or if he answers that he didn't, John punches Len, knocking him to the ground. Joe encourages the group to teach Len a lesson, after which he reveals that he saw Len put a rabbit in Daryl's bag, but wanted to let Len prank him. The group brutally beats Lena to death. A new group consisting of Abraham, Eugene, Rosita, Maggie, Bob and Sasha saves Glenn and Tara from three walkers in the tunnel. Later, Maggie mentions that she shot into the roof of the tunnel to lure the walkers into a trap, and they were able to move to the other side. While resting in the tunnel, Eugene manages to convince Abraham to go to Terminus with the others so they can rest and regroup before continuing on to Washington. After leaving the camp with the group, Daryl sees Len's beaten body with an arrow in his head. Joe informs Daryl that they are tracking down a man, Rick, who killed one of them and may be heading to Terminus. Daryl asks about Terminus, and Joe replies that Terminus is a lie. Daryl notices a lone strawberry growing out of the ground and claims it. Joe, Daryl and the Marauders walk past the candy wrapper that Carl and Michonne previously shared lying between the sleepers on the rails, indicating that they are walking behind Rick, Carl and Michonne. A large group consisting of Abraham, Eugene, Rosita, Maggie, Bob, Sasha, Glenn Terra easily enters the silent terminus and observes the tranquility of the area. In the courtyard, a woman doing laundry is standing with her back to the group. Hearing their approach, she turns around and introduces herself to Mary. A friendly woman greets a haggard group of survivors on terminus and offers to cook them a plate. The scene ends with Mary's words. Welcome to Terminus. Rick, Carl and Michonne are camping in the woods, sitting around a campfire and checking one of the newly installed traps for animals. As a result, they find a small rabbit, and after Rick explains in detail to Carl how he was caught, he hears a cry for help and runs a little further into the forest. Rick and Michonne try to stop him, but are forced to give chase. They all find a man in a large forest clearing, and he barely fights off a herd of walkers. Carl quickly raises his beret, but Rick stops him in the form that they are clearly in the minority and it's too late for the man, as the walkers break into him, first tearing out his right eye. Several walkers notice the three as they run away. Rick, Carl and Michonne pass through a railroad crossing and fight with several walkers on the way, after which they continue to retreat. The group eventually finds an abandoned SUV and decides to camp near it for the night. Later, Rick and Michonne discuss business around the campfire, while Carl sleeps in the truck. Joe and his group suddenly appear and ambush Rick and Michonne. Meanwhile, Carl is ambushed by Dan of the car. Tony immediately recognizes Rick, and the group realizes that they managed to find their man, it was he who killed Lou. After John starts a tense countdown, Daryl appears and tries to end the scene. Daryl claims that Rick and the others are good people but Joe just tells him that Rick was responsible for killing their friend. When Daryl offers himself instead of Rick, Joe looks shocked. He calls Daryl a liar for saying that Rick is a good person, and calls on the rest of the group to beat Daryl to death for lying. Joe then informs Rick that they are going to beat Daryl to death, rape Carl, then Michonne, and finally end them by killing Rick. While Dan is trying to rape Carl, Rick lands a headbutt backwards that hits Joe in the face, stunning him. Joe reflexively shoots and misses, but the shot hits Rick right in the head, which stuns him for a moment. Rick punches Joe, who retaliates with his pistol whip, knocking Rick to the ground. While Rick tries to get to his feet, still a little shell-shocked, Joe fixes Rick in place by grabbing him, pinning his arms and holding him motionless. Joe asks, what the hell are you going to do now, man? In response, Rick bites his carotid artery, killing him. Then Michonne, taking advantage of the chaos, kills Tony and Harley with shots to the head from Tony's revolver, who watched in horror as their leader was killed in one of the most brutal ways. Daryl then took advantage of the pause to knock Billy to the ground and viciously trample him to death. When all the members of his group are dead, Dan still holds Carl hostage and tells everyone not to approach, otherwise he will kill Carl without hesitation. Then Rick grabs Joe's penknife and goes straight at Dan, 
saying, he's mine. Dan lets go of Carl, who runs off into Michonne's arms. Rick quickly approaches the stunned Dan. Dan begs for mercy, but Rick does not want to listen to him and stabs him several times, destroying him. Carl narrows his eyes, watching what is happening. Returning to the numb Rick leaning against the SUV, Daryl hands Rick a rag soaked in water so that Rick can dry off. Inside the SUV, Michonne holds Carl's sleeping head to her. Daryl begins to blame himself for not having the slightest trust in his former comrades, but Rick says it's not his fault and that he's Rick's brother. Eventually Carl wakes up and hears Rick and Daryl talking. Soon after, they find Terminus. The group decides to split up to explore the facility before sneaking inside, in case Terminus turns out to be not quite the shelter it pretends to be. Carl and Michonne go together, where they have a moment of rapprochement. Michonne tells Carl about how her son died in the refugee area, which was invaded by walkers while Michonne was jogging. Her partner and suddenly did nothing to protect her because they were on drugs. After being bitten, she admits that she allowed them to transform, then remove their jaws and arms and use them to protect herself from other walkers. She also admits that her act was sick. After this comment, Carl says that Rick is proud of him, but feels that out of all these terrible thoughts in his head, he deserves nothing and that he is just another monster. Rick puts his colt in a duffel bag full of weapons and buries it in the woods behind Terminus in case of unforeseen circumstances. Then the four make their way inside by climbing over the fence. They end up in a room where a bunch of people work, including Garrett's characters, Alex a woman repeating the phrase shelter for everyone into a radio transmitter, which Daryl, Michonne, Tyrese and Bob heard in the car during a trip for medicines much earlier. Gareth asks the four to lay down their weapons and calls out to them, welcoming them to Terminus and warning them not to try to do anything stupid while Alex shows them around. Strangely, he doesn't take their weapons. During a meeting with the mayor's office offering food, Rick draws attention to a lot of items held by the survivors in the Terminus, such as Glenn's gear, Daryl's poncho that Maggie was wearing, the orange hitchhiker's backpack that Glenn took from prison, and even Herschel's distinctive pocket watch. Realizing that something is wrong, he angrily beats off a plate of food that Alex offers Carl, grabs Alex, and puts a 45 caliber, which he took from Joe, to his face, demanding to tell where their people are and why their group has pocket watches, riot gear and ponchos. Alex lies and claims that he found a pocket watch on a dead man, and Gareth also hides behind a lie, claiming that the equipment was found on a dead policeman, and Ponchi's on a clothesline. Alex then accidentally shoots and kills one of his own, which causes a big shootout in which Rick, Michonne, Carl and Daryl flee. They are forced to run through several alleys riddled with bullets, which indicates that the survivors in Terminus also treated many other newcomers. During the chase, the team briefly turns to the left as they run, and bones and flesh are clearly visible in the foreground, scattered on a blue tarpaulin. Muffled cries for help can also be heard from nearby shipping containers. Soon the group reaches the back fence of Terminus, but stops as it sees that many residents of Terminus are lined up behind the surrounding fences with weapons. Garrett orders the four to lower their weapons again. With no other choice, Rick gives up. After that, Garrett calls them by certain nicknames so that they enter the car located to their right. Rick is the leader, Daryl is the archer, Michonne is the samurai and Carl is the kid in that order. After entering the car and closing the door, they find Bob, Maggie, Sasha, Glenn, Tara, Abraham, Rosita and Eugene. Rick notices Tara from the governor's army, but doesn't say anything. Abraham notices that they won't be there for long, to which Rick replies no. Then Rick goes to the hole in the side wall of the car and says they will feel very stupid when they find out. Abraham asks Rick what they will find out, to which Rick replies. They ran into the wrong ones. 